our first uh, colloquium presentation of the spring 21, uh, 2021 semester with Yale's Council on Middle East Studies. My name is Vish Sektivel and I have the honor of hosting today's session. And so I welcome you all on behalf of CMES. Um, and before we start, I just want to say a couple quick thank yous. Um, the chair of CMES, Marsha Inhorn and acting chair, Jonathan Wurtson, for um, convening the scholars that are gonna be part of our speaker series. Um, we also must thank, of course, uh, Kristen Siebert and Marwa Khabur for their um, wizard-like skills in coordinating the sometimes um, complex technology and logistics. Uh, and of course, we also thank um, my fellow postdoc colleague, uh, Dan uh, Tavana, who helped greatly to publicize today's uh, webinar. And so I'll turn now uh, to welcoming Professor uh, Beth Derdarian, who will be giving her talk today entitled Margins of Freedom, Censorship, Critique, and Contemporary Art in the UAE, which comprises a part of her in-progress uh, in book manuscript on the changes in the UAE art scene between the uh, Louvre Abu Dhabi's announcement in, 20, uh, in 2007 and its eventual opening. Uh, Dr. Derdarian is Assistant Professor of Anthropology and Museum Studies at the College of Worcester. She was a postdoctoral scholar at CMES last year. Um, her work focuses broadly on the politics of representation in art worlds, and her current work examines traveling exhibitions of Arab and Muslim artists to the U.S. as modes of cultural diplomacy, in, in, in particular focusing on discourses that equate the presence of art with proof of civilization and with an absence of terrorism. And she received grants from uh, Fulbright and from the al Qasimi Foundation to conduct this research. Dr. Derdarian has a PhD in anthropology from Northwestern and a master's in Near Eastern studies and museum studies from uh, New York University. So the way our webinar is going to go today, um, those of you who tuned in last semester um, observed a back and forth format. And some of our talks this semester will be in that format and some will be um, presentations. So today we'll be following the latter format. Beth will present her work and she'll speak for about 40 or so minutes. And we will um, thereafter move into audience Q&A. And so when we do, please um, type your questions into the Q&A box below. It should be like, I think over here somewhere. Um, and if you wish, uh, please feel free to type in your questions at any point in the presentation, and I will do my best as moderator uh, to get to them in the time that we have for Q&A. Okay, so with that, um, thank you so much, Beth, for being here with us, and uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction, Vish, um, and thanks so much to Marsha, um, Kristen, Marwa for the invitation, all their work um, behind the scenes, and, and to Vish and Daniel for your support today. Um, hopefully you can see my screen share okay um, at this point. Um, I'm so happy to be here and, and happy to be back part of the CMES community again. Um, all right, so today uh, I want to talk about censorship and critique in contemporary art. If they can't read it, it's not subversive, an artist named Maha told me laughingly. I had asked her whether she felt restricted by the UAE government's strict prohibition of criticism and political commentary. She continued, reading what artwork is, it's only a small percentage that can say, this is what it's articulating. Here, Maha's comments are reminiscent of Bourdieu and Darbel, who argued that as symbolic goods, works of art exist only for those who have the means of appropriating them, that is, deciphering them. To create works that could be deciphered by the right audiences and largely ignored by potential censors was what made Maha's work enjoyable to her. She remarked, that's the attractive part in the UAE. There are rules to play with. For Maha, it was actually the UAE's strict legislation on speech and expression that made her task as an artist challenging and interesting. The UAE hasn't always had a reputation for strict oversight of speech. One local curator commented that the 80s and 90s were a time of great leeway in expression. He said, at the time, the nation was busy with lots of other things, electricity, roads, art was kind of a luxury. The early artists were not neglected. They were just doing something that people didn't understand. No one banned you. The early artists were exhibiting in every public space in the UAE in the 80s and 90s, and Hassan Sharif started in caricature. 
He was criticizing a lot of stuff, but he was publishing in public. The real question is about the margin of freedom that was present and how it's changed. So here are a few examples of uh, Hassan Sharif's work. He is considered by many to be um, the godfather of contemporary art in the UAE. So um, these were published originally in the 70s. On the left, we have uh, an image of people in Kandura coming out of an oil pipeline with the caption, Emirates University Developing People. In the center, a bureaucrat leans over the desk to tell an old man, get three witnesses over the age of 80 and have your father come see me, see me commenting on the vagaries of new citizenship documentation processes in the new, uh, newly formed United Arab Emirates. The UAE became a state in 1971, a nation state. And finally, the woman on the right tells her friend, my son is a big employee. He can delay the most important transaction, satirizing uh, what we Middle East scholars uh, fondly discuss as wasta. These caricatures and cartoons appeared in Emirati newspapers between 1974 and 78. And when I first came across them, I was surprised as this kind of political commentary would not appear in Emirati newspapers today. In the past decade, there have been many well-publicized instances of art uh, being removed or deinstalled in the Gulf states from the sudden 2011 firing of Sharjah Biennial director Jack Persekian over this work, Maport Leash by Mustafa Ben Fodel, to the 2012 removal of works referring to the Arab Spring at Art Dubai, to the removal of Adel Abdesamed's headbutt coup de tete statue um, in Qatar, and the near instantaneous removal of Muhammad Sharaf's cemetery of banned books in Kuwait in 2018. Outside critics often point to these incidents as proof of the Gulf states' authoritarianism and their intolerance for free speech, which, were posit which are posited as contrapuntal to the existence of a flourishing contemporary art world. Freedom of expression is necessary for the making of real art, so the framing goes. Concerns over how to display proper art history without nudes, for example, has been a preoccupation since the first announcement of plans for the Louvre Abu Dhabi. This is a 2007 uh, article on the, the plans for the uh, Louvre Abu Dhabi um, with the title in the Guardian with the title France divided over nude free Louvre in the Gulf. This preoccupation remains uh, in 2017, when the Louvre actually opened. Um, these, this juxtaposition of quotes about nudes being provocative next to the Picasso image is clearly intended to raise an eyebrow and make us question what is actually nudity. That the museum was showing works from non-Muslim religions or works that were atheistic in nature are part of the subtitle here in the um, art newspaper, nudes, non-Islamic religions, questioning the nature of God, question mark. Um, and note that this image uh, around it is, is accompanying it is sure to show a partial nude. And finally, this last news item here at the bottom reiterates the idea of the Gulf as devoid of culture, a cultural desert, spectacular perhaps, but a desert nonetheless. This constant media barrage reiterates tropes of extreme gender segregation, of backwardness, ultra conservative Islam, tropes that have long ties to Orientalist thinking, but also the phenomenon of Gulf exceptionalism, which Ahmed Khanna, Amalie Le Renard, and Neha Vora have recently written about. This exceptionalism relies on tropes of hyper modernity and inauthenticity, the authors point out. And in the case of the art world, these tropes complicate the lives and work of artists who struggle against assumptions about the region as a tabula rasa and ultimately devoid of culture. Moving beyond sensationalizing headlines and lazy exceptionalizing portrayals of the region, I want to show how artists who live in the UAE experience constraints on their speech. My argument today has two parts. First, I argue that overt political politicized critique has become an important tenet in validating contemporary art as good or legitimate. Subsequently, this valorization of critique places artists based in the UAE in a double bind. And I want to explore that double bind and examine the strategies they use to make their critiques legible or illegible and at what junctures they choose to do so. So what is this double bind? Many residents like Maha rely on residency visas to stay in the country. In fact, 85% of the UAE's population do not hold citizenship. The UAE does not offer birthright citizenship, nor is there a naturalization procedure. Emirati citizenship is transmitted patrilineally. Depending on their passports, non-citizen communities in the UAE face limited prospects for work or migration elsewhere. 
especially in recent years, for example, as the prior US presidential administration attempted to ban any immigration by those carrying documents from many majority Muslim states. Retaining residency privileges in the UAE is therefore of paramount importance, and many of my interlocutors were keen to obey the UAE's laws to avoid jeopardizing their residency. The UAE has strict slander laws. Slander is a criminal, not a civil offense, and criticizing the royal families or the big three monotheistic religions is forbidden. Dubai's highest court, the Court of Cassation, has held that criticism can be defamatory if it, quote, affects the honor of a defamed individual. Victims of alleged defamation can win a libel case simply by proving that their reputation suffered. The truth of the statement is not necessarily a defense. Therefore, merely saying something negative, although it might be factually correct, can constitute a crime and be punishable with up to seven years of jail time, deportation, or substantial fines. In recent years, the UAE has prohibited social media posts in support of cutteries, especially after the 2017 blockade, or criticisms of the UAE's normalization of relations with Israel this past year. So critique can be dangerous and there are consequences. And hence, many of my interlocutors were quick to identify themselves as apolitical. Although, of course, as an anthropologist, I think that claiming to be apolitical is actually itself um, a political claim. Yet, while UAE-based artists can benefit from self-presenting as apolitical or apartisan, there are important reasons for contemporary artists to identify as political and critical. They must be perceived as such to be taken seriously by an international art market and a community of curators, biennial organizers, and gallerists. Since the 1980s, criticality has emerged as a central hallmark of real, legitimate, or authentic contemporary art amongst art elites. There are, of course, other modes of judging artwork, such as its beauty, realism, its religious message, as we've seen in prior historical periods. Art historian David Joselet notes that in the 80s, the locus of aesthetic value shifted from quality to criticality, from the good to the subversive. That is a defining characteristic of good contemporary art in the current post-1989 period is criticality. This oppositional model, as Joanna Drucker terms it, uh, she's an art historian, um, and is widespread. And Sarah Neal Smith, another art historian, writes of, quote, conventional art history's enduring insistence that to be a legitimate artist, one must work single-handedly in the service of an avant-garde agenda, end quote. To express critique, artists must make an overt stated conceptual intervention about a political context, especially around political regimes or social organization, this framework of contemporary art as necessarily conceptual, necessarily critical, and often politically dissident or subversive means that art becomes inherently adversarial, questions the status quo, and purports a radical politics. So UAE-based artists, are, whether they are citizens or non-citizens, are caught in a double bind. Should they express direct political critique in their work, they risk breaking Emirati laws and jeopardizing their ability to stay in the UAE but they tend to be viewed more positively and validated by an international art elite. If they express a more oblique critique, their artwork is often not categorized by a global art world as contemporary art and is not taken as seriously, but their UAE residency is safe. The stakes are high for artists who hope to compete in a contemporary art market that is nearly as competitive as academia. As I learned during my field work in the UAE between 2015 and 17, Artists rely on curatorial selection to advance and to gain recognition. For example, uh, a good showing at an exhibition at a local art center might be seen by a curator who selects the artist in residence for Art Dubai or the Sharjah Biennial, both venues with a much broader global visibility. These opportunities in turn can open up artists to international curators or they help them score a solo or group show or possibly representation with one of the UAE's well-regarded galleries such as the Third Line or Gallery IVDE. Artists whose work does not meet the parameters of what curators define as real or good art struggle to exhibit in well-attended shows and they often fall from visibility. Writ large, the question of contemporary art and legitimacy is about the disciplining of high culture, how different actors express, reproduce, or reconfigure power in the cultural realm. It is about the ways that particular forms of speech and expression are heard and validated and others are ignored. 
By focusing on the ways that the UAE, that UAE artists handle this double bind, this research aims to provincialize critique after Chakrabarti's concept of provincializing, advocating for other modes of critique that eschew the explicitly or directly political. I do not wish to validate a definition of contemporary art that includes critique by showing the criticality in these artists' works or fall prey to what Laila Abulurad terms the romance of resistance by discovering Orientalist style, some undercover resistance art scene in the UAE. My aim is instead to demonstrate how artists creatively play with the rules, as Maha phrased it, to reframe what critique is and how it can be expressed. Furthermore, as Didier Fassin has noted, quote, the critical attitude is presented as emancipation of the subject, end quote, in the liberal paradigm. Liberation is needed before one can question domination. So performing critique is also a way for artists to perform autonomy and their own subjecthood. Critique in its many forms helps us to understand processes of legitimacy in contemporary art, how artists assert their own subjecthood and hierarchies of high culture. So artists in the UAE uh, offer their critiques in strategically ambiguous ways. This strategic ambiguity gives them room to claim that their works are apolitical. UAE-based artists create ambiguity by relying on the polysemy of the visual, by avoiding explicit documentation or references to the critique and texts accompanying the work, or by performing or exhibiting in venues to which they control access, which is um, what I call circumscribing audiences, and I'm happy to share more about that sort of more technical strategy in the Q&A. What I focus on today um, is the tactic of conspicuous omission, meaning that artists labor to forge noticeable gaps or voids. Silences can be powerful and are certainly not neutral as scholars including Anne-Laura Stoller, Michelle Ralph Trio, and Rona Kapadia have argued. Museums and archives also occasionally adopt a version of this tactic to highlight the troubled histories of their collectors and collections, displaying a problematic object but obscuring it, for example, Anthropologist Kimberly Christen's Digital Dynamics Across Cultures project features black boxes or tape that obs um, obscures images according to protocols of the Aboriginal communities in which she worked. This is a practice of intentionally calling out the absence of knowledge or the absence of permissions and also occurs in museum display. Um, this is an example of indigenous ceremonial objects um, at the University of British Columbia's Museum of Anthropology. This photo was taken in November, 2019. Um, these objects are swathed in brown fabric and the accompanying sign reads, traditionally our wolf headdresses, whistles and other objects with supernatural powers were put away when not being shown in ceremony. For some of our people to have these things on display for the public is very disturbing. One thing that we might be able to do is wrap some of the masks on display. This is so the public can understand that not everyone is meant to see these things. And this quote is attributed to Michael Willey of the Tsawatanu First Nation. So however, in contradistinction to these examples, among UAE-based artists, the intent is that they forge gaps that are legible only as gaps to a limited audience, whereas these are uh, calling out absence essentially for everyone. So um, I'm actually gonna stop sharing here. Um, because I'm not able, I don't want to share images of um, the artworks that I'm going to be talking about. I've, I've an anonymized my interlocutors um, at their request and, and in order to protect them because I am making their critiques quite explicit um, and I don't want any images of the work um, that might actually um, undo that anonymization. All right, so conspicuous omission. When describing how to conspicuously omit something to me, my colleague Leila said, I'd compliment your blouse and your shoes and your necklace and your earrings, but say nothing about your pants. By conspicuously leaving out the pants, Leila singled them out and I never wore them again. Conspicuous omission was a way in which my interlocutors communicated critiques, just not explicitly, not in words. And conspicuous is a key piece of this strategy. Conspicuous omission as a mode of critique relies on a shared understanding of what is conspicuous or obvious. In another example, one art critic shared, if a reader knew four art shows opened last night and he only wrote about three of them, the reader understands that this is a conspicuous omission. The critic would essentially be saying, the show wasn't even worth writing about. There's the critique. It's selective unselection, he said. 
Conspicuous omission relies on shared communal knowledge, specifically knowing the landscape and context well enough to know what is missing, or the kinds of issues that cannot be expressed directly, or even who to ask for clues. One particular instance reveals how different forms of critique and the social contextual knowledge needed to make such distinctions collided as foreign artists and curators interacted with the local arts community. On a balmy January evening, I attended a reading group at a local arts center. Alana, a visiting British artist, asked me for a ride home from the lecture. As we drove, I asked her about the commission she was working on, which would be exhibited at an art fair and which had brought her to Dubai in the fir first place. She explained how her idea for her work, which was not well received by the other artists or curators or the art center where she was working, had been declined. In the passenger seat, Alana toyed nervously with her long wavy black hair. She had wanted to do a project on surveillance and the monitoring of speech and expression, meaning how do you live in places like the UAE where the government is watching you, listening to you all the time? And they admit it. Do you change your behavior? In what kinds of ways? Her art piece was to carry an electronic surveillance mechanism on her phone and allow viewers to log into the live stream at any time throughout the run of the fair. She would also document how she changed her behavior, knowing she might be overheard, but not by whom or when. She laughed, I certainly won't be taking my phone into the bedroom or the bathroom, that's for sure. In this way, her behavior during the fair would be an elaborate multi-day audio performance piece. Unfortunately, Alana told me, her pitch had not gone over well with the curator and fellow resident artists, and she had been told to come up with a new one for the commission. Now, she recounted, she needed to have another piece developed quickly in order to have it finalized by the time the commission would be exhibited, and time was running out. A year later, I sat on the veranda of a shisha joint with Maha. Maha had also been commissioned to make a work for the same fair organizer as Alana the preceding year, and was thus familiar with Alana's proposed project, a topic that we chanced upon when I asked her about the limits of what can be expressed in the UAE. Maha's eyes flashed with frustration immediately. I was in the meeting where Alana was being told, just change the wording of it so it doesn't come across as what it is. Maha noted that the framing was essential. One way of managing the politics of expression in the UAE was to avoid being explicit. It was not that Alana couldn't do this project, Maha explained. It was that she had to frame it benignly to protect herself, yet simultaneously for an art audience to get it. If Alana had admitted the explicit critique of state surveillance in her framing of the project, she could still have performed the work as planned. But Alana, as an outsider, did not understand why omission was necessary or that conspicuous omission, this practice of creating a gap that was strategically legible as such, could function as a mode of critique. Maha then raised the issue of consequences. We had a meeting amongst the artists. You have a right to say, as people working together, do you want to be recorded on this device or not? Personally, I didn't want to be on it at all. With her Palestinian papers, Maha was nervous about retaining her residency privileges in the UAE which could be easily revoked if she were surveilled on Alana's proposed project and caught criticizing the UAE or appearing to do so. She said, I was already kicked out of my country. I am not here for some small thing to trigger being uprooted again. For Maha, the omission of the work's explicit framing protected not only Alana, but the artists with whom she collaborated. So Alana's fellow resident artists first asked her to conspicuously omit elements of her project so it would appear benign, which would linguistically shield herself and anyone else who was captured on the surveillance. And as Maha intimated to me, the consequences for UAE residents who would be on the recording could be serious, deportation, banishment, in ways that Alana hadn't considered because she was unfamiliar with the country. In addition, because she carried a British passport, Alana would never face the kinds of consequences for inappropriate expression that those holding Lebanese, Palestinian, or Indian passports would, for example. Those more familiar with the political realities of the UAE were frustrated at Alana's perceived careless endangerment of them and their colleagues. And whether they agreed with her take on state surveillance was essentially irrelevant. They blocked her project and deployed their leverage as locals to protect their community. Because Alana did not share a communal understanding of how to express critique, her project did not come to fruition as she had hoped. This instance shows how key the conspicuous part of conspicuous omission is and the shared knowledge it relies on. 
Another way to engage in conspicuous omission was through carefully composing texts to accompany works, but leaving one small clue. On a sticky May afternoon, I began existing, assisting excuse me, my colleague Abdullah on materials for a show that he was curating. Abdullah had generously allowed me to observe the show's process for my research in exchange for assistance drafting the show's written materials. He had commissioned several local artists to produce works, and I worked with the artists to create the texts that would accompany those works. So the artist Hassan described the performance piece he had planned. Each day, he would enter the gallery and transcribe a page of the Quran with his left hand. Hassan was born left-handed, but growing up, he had been punished for writing with it in school. His teachers believed that left-handedness was a sign of Satan, evil to be avoided. And of course, in Islam, the left hand is the unclean hand. Um, yet for Hassan, it seemed incongruous that Allah would make him left-handed and then punish left-handedness. In a similar vein, the artist argued, any such instincts or predilections that one was born with, including, for example, homosexuality, could not be evil because they were Allah's creation. Hassan shared with me that he read his work as a critique of Islam or certain readings of it, which was directly drawn from his identification as a gay man. His work was about the ways in which different groups construe religious texts to condemn natural inborn human behaviors. As I worked with Abdullah and Hassan to draft the text for the exhibition catalog, it became very clear that we needed to frame the work in such a way that art audiences could get the critique, but where Hassan would not get in trouble for criticizing Islam or promoting indecent sexual behavior. Abdullah, the curator shared, one of my major concerns working with artists here is how to push them to do great stuff, but keep them safe. I don't want to see them suffering the kinds of things that earlier artists suffered from. Abdullah here referred to the gender and social stigma that it were attached to being an artist, but also hinted towards rumors that I had heard about artists who had not been allowed into or out of the UAE because of the content of their work, who were not allowed to represent the UAE abroad because of tussles with royal families, or whose exhibitions had been shut down by authorities after members of the public spoke out against them. After much deliberation and back and forth on Google Docs, we crafted a careful summary of the project. Rather than discuss questions of sexuality outright and potentially subject Hassan to legal or social fallout, the text we collectively produced read, the artist draws inspiration for this work from his curiosity about the ways that personal identity is formed. While engaging with the question of whether one's sense of self is shaped to a greater extent by genetics or experience, he explores the differences in human development arising from varying and sometimes false interpretations of Islam. He will carry out this investigation through a daily performance in which he reads and writes passages from the Quran. So the underlying themes of Hassan's work remain in this description, identity formation, interpretations of the Quran, genetics versus experience, which is a reframing of nature versus nurture, the text alludes to false interpretations of Islam, but is vague, as in it does not specify which interpretations might be false. Yet the parallel between left-handedness and sexuality, this key link that forms the critique, is not articulated, it's not rendered explicit in order to protect the artist. The title of the work contains the word left in it. For Hassan, this was the flag, this was the conspicuous clue, as most of the local community would understand religious prescriptions against writing left-handed, especially in writing um, with the Quran. Hassan came to the free public gallery every day throughout the run of the exhibition. Because he did not announce in advance when he would arrive to perform, some of his performances were unattended. Sometimes visitors just saw someone sitting and writing in the gallery and were likely unaware it was a performance. But he performed daily. He did not hide. He attended the opening. He spoke to visitors about his work. So in some ways, his work was very public. But the critical component of the work was only communicated orally and never recorded in writing or otherwise documented. Hence also why I, I can't show images, unfortunately. Um, the word left in the title points to this critique, albeit obliquely. So in this way, he was able to offer a critique of some interpretations of Islam by flagging the left-handedness, but drew strategically on ambiguity and indirectness in doing so in order to protect himself from potential repercussion. Because art allows for flexible expression and multiple interpretations and can avoid textual or explicit critiques, it actually becomes a rare space for critical expression in the UAE. 
The modes in which Hassan made his intent explicit were intentionally limited, undocumented, and ephemeral. And this mode offers plausible deniability, as Hassan could deny criticizing Islam and there would be no evidence to rebut this claim. Yet, while this strategy protected Hassan at home, as a fellow artist was quick to point out, it also renders the work of this artist unintelligible abroad. International artists, international audiences, excuse me, do not see these works criticality, which is seminal to their being designated and seen as contemporary art. So in this way, paradoxically, protecting artists at home to support their careers can actually stunt those careers internationally. I asked one artist, Arjun, about getting permission to do some of his projects, which had been in quite public spaces and at some points even involved Emirati bureaucratic agencies. And he told me, the major part of this place, the part that I like, is that it's not completely regulated. There are all these informal economies. If I were in the UK, I've, I'd have needed permits to do this work, but here I could just run my racket. Those gaps are there. The artists I worked with, like Arjun, Hassan, Maha, they understood that the margins, the gaps, were spaces of freer expression, of possibility, of opportunity. The margins of freedom that earlier artists had enjoyed had shifted in size and in location, but these margins, these gaps of, were spaces where a critique, perhaps not always legible as critique, could flourish. Anthropologist Claire Harris points out, the contemporary art world is predicated on a paradox. Quote, it privileges the idea that the creators of artworks are first and foremost artists and that other aspects of their identity are less significant. What matters is the quality of their work rather than their biography or the place they came from. However, even as agents of the art world seek to renounce old categories of national, quote, primitive, black, post-colonial art in preference for the stateless, deracinated, the global, there is still a desire to discover previously underrepresented ethnicities and undiscovered territories. It is perhaps ironic that many of the artists I worked with were Muslim women, LGBT Muslims, or spoke Arabic rather than English as a mother tongue. These are pre precisely the underrepresented groups that an international art elite hungers for. Yet in order to be legible to the contemporary art world, artists must perform a particular version of critique in their work, one that is not necessarily accessible to all. In adhering to a particular definition of what constitutes critique in contemporary art, Elite curators and organizers enforce a normative definition of the political as well. These practices and norms facilitate the participation of artists working in regimes that afford them the right to criticize the state and rewards artists who are direct rather than subtle in, their, in those critiques. Yet these examples demonstrate the ways that the practice of critique is inherently malleable and flexible. Artists in the UAE drew on ambiguity and the flexibility of visual mediums to offer an iteration of critique that's deeply informed by its context. And even as they reproduce the idea that contemporary art must include direct political critique, they offered new visions of what contemporary art could entail and the ways in which it engaged the communities from which it arose. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Beth, for um, that really fascinating talk. Um, before I open it up to the audience, I thought I would sort of ask the first couple questions just to sort of kick us off. Um, and I have, I have, I have two of them. Um, first, uh, I was especially intrigued by the rather like Orientalist news coverage of the Louvre, uh, uh, Abu Dhabi that. You know, the lack of nudity somehow rendered it lacking in like artistic completeness. You know, they like even like invoke the desert, which is all kind of in line with these sort of popular tropes, yeah. especially in the West. And I think sometimes internalized perhaps in Arab contexts that, you know, Islam or the East, you know, more broadly is necessarily maybe incompatible with art and the modernity that like real art presumably confers. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious about the types of discourses you came across in your ethnographic process, if any of artists either attempting to push back against this or how they kind of, and you spoke a little bit about how they kind of navigate the very real constraints of UAE law and surveillance on the one hand, but also kind of having to navigate between that as well as the attempts by Western onlookers to kind of gatekeep um, artistic authenticity or kind of um, strip uh, you know, Emirati artists of their artistic legitimacy on the other um, if you could maybe talk a little bit more 
about yeah. that piece. I mean, in particular, the question of nudity has been one that's extremely, um, that, that has just remained again, like from that initial 2007 announcement and, and the responses to it. Um, there's, you know, a lot of um, sort of discourses both in the media, but also, you know, elsewhere um, about how Islam prohibits figurative representation and, and how nudity is particularly offensive. Um, but there are other schools of Islam that do not feel that is not necessarily iconoclastic in that way. Um, so there's that has kind of goes back and forth and it becomes this barometer of, um, there's a couple barometers uh, of how, you know, authentic one is, uh, particularly with the idea that it's hard to be religious and an artist that, 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 you know, real artists aren't really religious, but they're, you know, critical thinkers and, and able to think beyond um, religion, which becomes, you know, which is not accurate, obviously, but there's an idea of that. Um, so we see, you know, ideas about um, not representing people and concerns about non-figurative um, or the absence of figurative representation. Um, we see concerns about nudity. Um, you know, one of the um, complaints that came up about about the impossibility of NYU Abu Dhabi, which you know is going strong, um, ten years in, um, was uh, that that homosexuality is forbidden in in the Emirates, and so how are you going to have a liberal arts university in a place where you know homosexuality is illegal? Um, so these kinds of questions about sort of what constitutes, you know, I think so much of the definition of contemporary art in particular, I'm not going to speak as much about modern art, but contemporary art in particular really falls under liberal paradigms, like liberal, you know, very classical liberal paradigms um, of, of um, you know, be, of free speech, utterly, you know, a religious or non-religious speech, and that really uh, those biases um, really come into play when when you see artists from from Arab and Muslim backgrounds trying to make work. And I will just also add that sometimes, you know, the artists, um, some of the artists that I worked with. Um, were able to use some of those tropes to their advantage. For example, you see artists um, gaining success, particularly if there's a like a Muslim woman artist who makes work about um, Islam being patriarchal and oppressive. That work tends to be picked up and celebrated. Um, or, you know, I have another artist who um, was constantly interpreted as making work about Islam and gender when it what it had nothing to do with that. But because she she wore hijab, that was assumed that she had to be making work about that. So the presumption of uh, like who can speak about what you know we see this in the academy too. <laughs> um, who can speak about what and what you know what their work must be about. Um, we see that especially like artists from this part of the world or who are based here are often delimited that they have to sort of speak about these particular issues or take a stance on them in ways that other artists aren't sort of litmus tested in the same way. Um, that's great. Um, that really is really, we have a question from uh, Sonali Pahua. Um, she says, Beth, uh, how do Lebanese Egyptian Palestinian curators approach Emirati art? Do they also orientalize it or are they able to appreciate the strategic license, uh, strategic silences? Um, thanks, Sonali, for that question. Yeah, the, the, I would say that the the art the curators who um, in particular like there were there were a couple Syrian curators of Syrian or Iraqi backgrounds um, had a much um, more expansive understanding of of how of the context um, and also sort of different ideas about um, Islam. It, it also, I would also say I'm just thinking um, a Pakistani as curators as well. Um, so, you know, folks who had had more of a background tended to be a, like understand the context a little bit better um, and were more able to understand these silences. Um, although I will say there were a couple of curators of, of British background um, who were extremely sensitive um, to their to the work that their artists were doing and really put in a lot of work in terms of having conversations with them um, about their work to make sure that they were representing it um, carefully and accurately. Um, so it's not, it, 
I think it might have been easier perhaps for those who come from Arab or Muslim backgrounds, curators of Arab or Muslim backgrounds um, to understand the context, but there I did see examples of other curators who who did um, who who really tried um, to, to understand better. Um, thank you for that question. We also have a question from that actually leads really well into uh, the question we have from um, Dr. Marsha Inhorn. Uh, thank you, Beth, for this really wonderful talk about the UAE artistic critique and censorship. Given the demographic makeup of the UAE, which is actually majority South Asian and which has not welcomed Middle Eastern refugee populations from, say, Syria, could you describe who the local artists are? Do their critiques concern issues of non citizenship? for the majority of people residing in the UAE. Um, I was curious about how you were using the term local given that in the UAE, locals are Emiratis. Do they figure in the art scene as artists as well? Um, thank you so much for that question, um, Marsha. Yeah, local, um, my the language becomes incredibly complicated here and, and actually a political choice. So I have chosen to call people who are UAE based locals um, or people who have lived there for a long time. Um, although typically in the UAE, you know, and part of that is 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 again, like my political choice because a lot of the people that I worked with had lived in the UAE for many, many years, but couldn't and called it home, but could not claim citizenship there. Um, and so local is a way to acknowledge um, their presence and their contributions. Um, local oftentimes in the UAE refers to um, national, well, they use the term nationals or, or citizens. Um, but I think there's a much there's a much broader resident community of people who have lived there for, for such a long time. Um, so we definitely, you definitely see, especially out of Sharjah, um, because Sharjah is a, um, um, was really sort of where um, Sheikh Sultan really promoted art in Sharjah beginning in the 80s. Um, and that's actually where Hassan Sharif held his first studio and started training artists. Um, Sharjah has a, a really, really diverse population. Um, and uh, especially in Sharjah, you see the influence of a lot of um, like, you know, Pakistani or South Asian um, artists um, and curators who are really welcomed and integrated into the scene. Um, even for example, um, Vivek Velasani, um, there was a recent exhibition called But We Cannot See Them at NYU Abu Dhabi that traced this crew around Hassan Sharif when he was making art in the 80s and 90s. And Vivek was one of them. Um, he was this Indian artist who came and lived in the UAE for a decade or two and then went back. Um, so there is a lot of connection with South Asia um, and South Asians very active in the art scene. Um, and they've definitely absolutely been, been integral. Uh, thank you, Beth. Uh, we have a question from Saeed Hussain. Um, what about the private world of art collecting in the UAE? Were you finding artists that were serving a clientele that had no rules on content? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Saeed. Um, Private art collecting, I would say there were a couple of different um, directions. Um, one, you have someone like Sultan Saud al Qasimi who has the Barjil Foundation. Um, he's a member of the Sharjah royal family, and his whole I his you know his idea of making a collection was wanting to create kind of a canon of Arab art and not seeing Arab and Muslim artists represented um, in, in an international art world. And so um, part of his work has really been to sort of excavate and uncover um, those artists. And that's been sort of the, the guiding um, force behind or the guiding idea behind his his building his collection. And that collection tours a lot um, as and has kind of a didactic me message or mission Private art collecting, on the other hand, you see um, there's a lot of, um, for example, very wealthy Iranian um, business people based in Dubai who collect like Iranian art. Or um, uh, one of the galleries um, in, in the UAE um, is Ayam Gallery, which was based out of Damascus and had to move to Dubai um, in, the, in the last decade. Um, and you know you have Syrian expatriates who are collecting Syrian art, um, or who are particularly interested in Syrian art. So you see, really, this um, you know there's the example of Sultan who's who's tried to make 
uh, who's arguing for a canon, um, who's arguing for an educational mission. And then on the other side, you see folks who are who are trying to support their compatriots or folks who are living in exile and using art as a way to connect with their heritage. Thank you for the question. Um, we have another question from uh, Laura Goffman. Uh, thank you, Beth. This was a great presentation. I wonder if you could speak a bit more about how language is used in shaping the messages, either direct or indirect, of art in these spaces. When are English, Arabic, or other languages used and by whom? Are there other languages you analyze as local? Um, thank you, Laura, for that question. That is a great question. So um, I, let's see. Um, most of the time in the UAE, um, English and Arabic were the primary uh, questions or the primary languages that folks um, were working in, in terms of museums. The um, exception to that is the Louvre Abu Dhabi because the Louvre is French. So of course we were going to have French. Um, so at the Louvre Abu Dhabi, you'll see French, um, Arabic and English um, on all the, the panels. Um, for the most part, Arabic and English um, were predominant, um, but there were also times um, where some of the artists, particularly those who were working, uh, who are, you know, had of South Asian heritage or from, you know, had lived in South Asia and were, are now um, in the UAE, would um, draw on like Malayalam or other um, languages. Um, one thing that I find really sort of disappointing, um, and I have proficiency in Arabic and and French and English, but I, I'm not. Um, I don't speak uh, Tagalog, which there is a very large Filipino community in the UAE, and there certainly have been some events that are directed towards the Tagalog community, um, Tagalog speaking community. Um, but things like, you know, um, Urdu or Malayalam are also, I think, really important languages, especially for organizations or artists who are trying to reach the communities in the UAE. Um, one thing that I find really disappointing is one of the main arts organizations in the UAE constantly describes itself as homegrown and organic. That's their, their like two buzzwords that anything about them always has those words in it. And they only ever offer programming in English. And that to me is um, shows a very limited understanding of who the art is for and um, given the sort of demographics of the UAE, it makes more sense to me to have um, more languages represented. If you really want, you know, people from all walks of life to be able to feel comfortable in these spaces and attend the, attend art events, there need to be, you know, Hindi, Urdu, Malayalam, Tagalog, those languages need to be represented too. And I haven't seen that too much. Um. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned in your talk uh, two types of uh, kind of strategies. You mentioned that artists kind of circumscribe their audiences by uh, performing or exhibiting in ways in which that allow the artist to control access. Um, and you mentioned the calculus in which people kind of create a strategic ambiguity. Mm -hmm. um, and then you focus on the other hand, the, the majority of your talk on another strategy of conspicuous omission. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about the former type, and I'm wondering if you could maybe elaborate on yeah, sure. the former strategy a bit more. Um, all right, I will try to share my screen again because I have I can share images of this. Um, so this was one example of of circumscribing audiences. So this is a show put on by Sant, and um, you'll see it's you know it's advertised online. And then it says, for location of this event, please send a request. Um, so this was one example of, um, this show was actually, the, the title of the show is If a Hymen Breaks and No One Hears It. It's um, Reem Feliknez did this amazing project on um, hymen repair remedies. Um, so um, that are offered to women in the MENA region. And mostly it's, um, uh, uh, mostly um, Muslim and Arabic speaking women, but she looks at these herbalist sort of sheikhs and doctors who are sending, selling these kind of crazy pro products online to restore hymen so that folks can, you know, presumably be virgins on their wedding night. Um, so this is obviously kind of a taboo subject. Um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, reasons why this might be uh, controversial for folks. Um, Feleknez, um, really wanted to focus on the way that women were being exploited. Um, and so she created this amazing work um, and, but she didn't, they showed it in a 
um, shop in Sharjah, but they withheld the location because they were afraid of being shut down for discussing sex openly, for um, promoting sort of indecent sexual behavior like sex before marriage and covering it up, um, and also openly talking about female anatomy. So one way that they controlled that and were able to actually successfully hold this exhibition was to just, you know, you had to request to be able to go see it, um, to get the location. It was not publicized. Um, so another example of um, circumscribing audiences, this is a work that was displayed in a gallery. It was just this piece of paper and it was framed and it's a riddle and there's a website and then a password. And the enter the password is the answer to the riddle and it will unlock the website. Ooh. Um, and um, the so the work as it was displayed in the gallery was again, just this piece of paper that was printed and framed. Um, but then the um, password unlocks a series of video pieces um, that actually dealt with sexual fetishes um, online. So those videos could not have ever been shared in a gallery um, at, at, you know, in the UAE at this point, but the artist found a way to offer a path to them that was somewhat restricted. Um, and I was at this exhibition, I saw a lot of people walk past it. Um, another um, great instance um, of, of this was, um, there's an artist who performed something called Live Feed, which is a really brilliant name. Um, so he actually broke his fast. Um, so he's from, um, has of Palestinian heritage, born and raised in the UAE and now resides in London. And he wanted to talk about his feelings of estrangement being sort of in London and not being able to come back to the Gulf without applying for visas to this place where, you know, he was born and raised and where his family still lives. So the work in the work live feed, he actually created, um, and this was well before Zoom became you know, what it was, it became in 2020. Um, he performed over um, Zoom a breaking of his fast in London, but on Gulf Standard Time. Um, and again, it was called Live Feed, which is a great play on the digital and the eating. It's just great. Um, but this was something, he shared the link to this performance um, only with a limited group of people um, so that he could sort of control who saw it. But, and again, it was, you know, a little controversial or he con was concerned that it would be controversial. One, because he was talking about his feelings of exile from a country that he loved um, but could never fully claim. And two, because he was breaking his fast early, which um, according to uh, most interpretations of Islam invalidates the fast. So he was actually breaking it three hours early in London for London time. Um, and so he was doing something that was not prescribed um, under Islam. So, you know, controlling the location, doing, you know, performances online that are limited um, in access um, or providing something like, you know, a, a pathway to the work through this like password protected website are ways that um, artists have actually in like creatively use digital <laughs> strategies to circumscribe their audiences and ensure that they can do something that, um, that offers a critique, but in a way that won't get them in trouble. We have a question uh, from uh, Neha Bora. Uh, Hi Beth, thanks for this talk. Could you discuss how criticisms of class and labor come out or don't in the local art scene? <laughs> um, thank you, that's a great question. Um, I, there have been a couple of works that have focused on that, um, but for the most part, that's actually one of the topics that doesn't get addressed. Um, and you know, some <laughs> something, some other things that are controversial, you know, do do get shown. But um, there was there's an artist named um, Vikram Devecha who did a work. Um, about the labor value. And so he actually used his um, commission fee to hire people to draw their own portraits. So whatever they're like, and it was it was an equal amount. So say it was like twenty dollars. Um, so he would give, you know, gave like 15 different people twenty dollars and said, however much of your time, like you, you know, however your much of your time this will pay for in terms of the wage that you normally get for your work, spend that time doing a portrait of yourself. Um, and so then he showed all these portraits um, and um, they were accompanied with information about the, the 
wage it, like the labor, the different kinds of laborers, um, the different kinds of work that people were performing, um, but not their names or other identifying information. Um, and he insisted um, that the entirety of the collection be sold as a whole. He wasn't willing to sell like individual portraits off of it. Um, so this was, um, that was one of the works that called attention to the different sort of like value of and I'm making it up, it wasn't $20, it was like 200 dirham, but the value that $20 holds for someone who's, you know, um, working in construction versus someone who's, you know, maybe manning a booth at the Dubai Mall versus someone who's, you know, running an art center um, and, and just the incredible income variation that we see in the UAE. Um, to my knowledge, that's the only work that uh, explicitly dealt with like the, and that was mostly, again, focused on money rather than uh, the, not the conditions of labor, I should say. Great. Um, I'll ask one final question kind of before we wrap up. And you touched on this a little bit, but the curator that you talk about in your, uh, in your ethnography, uh, Abdullah, um, and several of your, of your other interlocutors, express um, a great level of like awareness and kind of reflexivity on um, the limits on their speech and what can kind of be expressed um, explicitly. Would you say that those people that you presented are relatively representative of the wider set of curators um, that you kind of moved with uh, mm -hmm. in, your, in, in the UAE? Like did most of them kind of spend a lot of time kind of negotiating uh, the stakes and limits that you that you raised in your talk today. Um, great question. Yeah, I think so. Most of the curators that that I did real work with um, were folks who were, you know, living and employed in the UAE full time. Um, so. For the most part, um, you know, people were aware of limits. You know, I was also aware of like my own visibility, my own limits, especially like you know, as a white American um, and being on a Fulbright, there were certain, you know, um, certain things in terms of my positionality to be aware of. Um, again, the curators um, that I worked with were mostly people that were that I really got to know. Um, were people who were living there and really embedded in it. And so they were also, this was also not just about their own success as individuals, like, but also the success of the community. Like, this is how we, you know, the, everybody sort of felt like we are building an art scene. We are aware that people are looking at us um, and that, and that with a sort of doubting glance, um, and we're really working to try to build this community together. I did a couple of interviews um, with folks who came in um, from outside, meaning they didn't live in the UAE full time. But for the most part, um, and sometimes those are like the star, star curators, um, but for the most part, um, I didn't feel like um, those folks were really representative of the community that I was working with. And most of the community that I was working with didn't have, you know, as strong of relationships um, with those folks because they were in and out. Um, Typically, those folks had a little bit more power, um, and some of them, um, you know, were really, really wonderful. Um, and then, um, and and work to try and understand the UAE. Um, I can think of one person who um, she had a number of sort of like short-term stints in the UAE, so she, you know, came back regularly um, for like three months at a time, and like she, you know, she really understood what was going on, and she was quite sensitive um, to things and really championed the artists she worked with. But, you know, the folks who were, you know, reside full-time in Paris and come to the UAE for a week for Art Dubai, you know, they, they did not have a solid, um, in my opinion, I don't think they had a really solid idea of what the politics on the ground were, or even the ways that they could have sort of intervened. And so um, I don't, you know, and also just because I didn't focus as much on them, I didn't spend as much time with them, they don't appear as much in, in my work. Um, so I think it's 101. I think we'll sadly have to start wrapping up, but um, I just want to thank you so much, Beth, for being with us and for this extremely, extremely fascinating talk. I learned a lot. Um, and I just wanna also remind the audience uh, that throughout the spring semester, we'll be having uh, the speaker series on designated Thursdays. Um, the full calendar is at the CMES website. 
And our next webinar is on Thursday, March 4. Uh, with Professor uh, Ronick Kapadia from the University of Illinois, Chicago. And he'll be talking about his book, um, Insurgent Aesthetics, Security and the Queer Life of the Forever War, which was published last year with Duke University Press um, and should be a very timely discussion. And that will be at the same time, 12 to one. Uh, and I've linked uh, in the chat um, where uh, people can RSVP uh, if they would like. Um, and so we really appreciate everyone coming to be here with us. Um, and so we thank you all. Uh, bye, everyone. Bye, Beth. Thank you. Thank you so much.